Hi Year 11, this is Miss Kersons about to deliver a revision lecture on Ozymandias by Percy Shelley. I'm going to start with some context because as you know you are marked for AO3 so it's important for you to know that Shelley was a famous romantic poet along with quite a few of the poets in our anthology which means that he was particularly focused on the beauty and the power of nature and that is a strong theme within this particular poem. Uh, he also really didn't trust those in power. He had a lot of distrust, particularly towards the current English monarch at the time, which was King George III. Um, he believed that King George was an arrogant, selfish monarch and that um, the English people should rebel against him. The poem itself is actually based on a particular ruler, um, which was Ramses II of Egypt. He was an Egyptian pharaoh and he was a particularly self-centered pharaoh he had a lot of monuments built a lot of statues built of himself and those statues most of them would have been built by unpaid slaves so he wasn't a particularly well liked or um, generous or pleasant ruler he was actually quite a cruel harsh ruler and so uh, you will see that in the poem in the presentation of Ozymandias the title itself is quite important because it is split into two parts, both of which come from Greek words. The first half of the name, Ozi, comes from the word Ozium, which means air. And the second half of the word, Mandius, comes from the Greek word mandate, which means to rule. Um, so essentially, this title literally means to rule air, which you could take to mean that his power is very intangible. It doesn't really mean much because you can't really grasp it. It's kind of lacking in any substance. He doesn't have any real solid power. Or you could take it to mean that he exerts power over too many things, over everything, including the air that we breathe, that um, the extent and the range of his power is far too much. So you could interpret that either of those two ways. Let's have a read through the poem. I met a traveller from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Okay, let's have a look at some key quotations then. So near the beginning of the poem, you've got this phrase, to vast and trunkless legs of stone. Now, I would argue that this is actually a bit of a juxtaposition because something that's vast, you imagine to be very powerful um, and strong, whereas something that's trunkless, which means that it has no torso, implies that it's powerless. It cannot exert any power or authority if it doesn't have a body. So that juxtaposition emphasizes how over time, the power of this vast statue has disintegrated. So Ozymandias has lost his power as time has gone on. And despite his arrogance, despite the fact that he had this vast statue, vast implying that he, he made it as big as possible to reflect how great he was, it still ends up being trunkless. It still loses all its power and becomes almost impotent, meaning it, it can do nothing. OK, and that's kind of the message of the poem, that no matter how powerful you are during your lifetime, ultimately, it's only temporary and it will be lost. This is a description of um, the statue's facial expression, and it's quite telling about what kind of ruler Ozymandias was, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command so you've got the idea of the frown and the wrinkled lip implying that he's a really harsh leader who kind of treated his people with cruelty and um, severity. He was always frowning at them. He would never show any kindness or compassion. And that idea of sneering at somebody, that the, the action of sneering is something that you would do 
if you were looking down on somebody, if you thought they were less than you. So you can tell that he's kind of, he believes he is in, he is superior to his subjects and he treats them with disdain. Disdain meaning when you, you look down on somebody. So not only is he harsh and cruel, but he's also disdainful. He thinks he's better than them. And that kind of cruel leadership is then reinforced with the alliteration of cold command, the harshness of those C consonants um, reflecting the harshness of his rule. On the statue, we are told that these words are engraved. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Now, I've zoomed in on this word is because it's very telling that he uses the present tense here. It's not my name was Ozymandias, you know, which is the truth because he is now dead. In fact, he is trying to imply that he is immortal, that he will last forever and that he still lives in the present tense. He is Ozymandias. So he thinks essentially that he can beat time, that he can win a race against time and actually survive forever, which, as we know, is, is not possible. So again, it kind of emphasizes his arrogance here. And then again, the phrase king of kings, he thinks he is the greatest king ever. It's almost superlative the way he thinks of himself as being not just a king, but the king, the king that everyone will remember and look back upon. You could argue that he's actually comparing himself here to Jesus or to uh, God, you know, the, the ultimate ruler. So he's kind of aligning himself with a deity here as if he has... Uh, he is omnipotent and omniscient. He's all-powerful and all-seeing. This is the second half of the engraving, which is also very telling about his attitude. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Now, you'll notice that this phrase is actually an imperative. Look on my works. He is commanding whoever it is that's looking at his statue to pay attention look on my works. It's not asking, it's not requesting, it is commanding, look on my works. So that imperative implies that he thinks he has authority over all other living beings. The use of the possessive pronoun my implies that he is claiming ownership over this statue, which seems a little bit unfair considering that we know he wouldn't have built it himself. Whilst he would have commissioned it and he would have commanded that it was built, it would actually have been his slaves who, who actually made it from scratch, who worked hard to produce this statue. And yet he gives them no credit at all. He doesn't recognise that they put the work in. He's claiming it as his own. Um, so this may be a comment from Shelley on the way in which leaders are corrupt. They kind of claim things as their own victories when in reality they are not um, deserving of that kind of praise. You'll also notice that this statement is directed at a specific kind of class of person. He's not saying he doesn't want to be recognised by just anybody. He wants to be recognised by ye mighty, meaning the strong people, the powerful people, the other rulers. He is only interested in their approval, which implies that he is kind of disregarding anyone of a lower class or anyone poor or anyone without power. He kind of dismisses them as unimportant. It is only ye mighty who he wants to impress, only people of a si similar calibre to himself. And then that word despair suggests that anyone who, who sees how powerful he is will be almost overwhelmed by his, his greatness. So it shows just how sort of naive he was to believe that no other ruler would ever equal his stature. It's very interesting that the following line is nothing beside remains, full stop. This completely undermines Ozymandias' arrogance. It completely undermines his claim that he is the king of kings and that he is immortal because it's telling us that essentially it's all been destroyed, that it's all gone, that over time it has disintegrated. So he's been proven wrong in his own statement that he is the king of kings um, and that people will look on him in despair because in reality, he barely even exists anymore. The statue is in pieces. That word nothing emphasising just how much damage has been done to the statue over time and how, um, how time and nature can wreak havoc 
on man-made objects, that man-made objects are kind of no match for the ravages of time. The full stop, of course, at the end there, creating a very blunt tone, nothing beside remains, full stop, which kind of emphasises the fact that we're undermining his arrogance. And then the final line here, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Really interesting, the kind of alliterative uh, consonants here, lone, level, sand, stretch. It's almost like an echo, which obviously is what you would hear if you were in a very large space. You would hear your voice echoing in the space. So I think what Shelley's doing here is emphasizing how vast nature is, how vast this desert is, that the, even if you were to just say one letter, it would be echoed back to you, l, l, s, s. And then that phrase far away without a full stop implies that nature is kind of boundless. It's limitless. It just keeps going. It's perpetual, which is a stark contrast to the statue of Ozymandias, which is falling apart and will eventually be destroyed. So you've got the power of nature and the, the immortality and the eternity of nature, the fact that it will always exist versus the sort of transience meaning not very long lasting nature of man and of man made objects. Okay, so overall, you've got this very arrogant ruler who was clearly disdainful and harsh and cruel towards his subjects in the past, um, being totally undermined and being shown that ultimately his power will come to nothing. So remember that when you're analysing this poem, you need to refer to Shelley's views. He is reflecting here on his own distrust of those who had power and his own um, he, disapproval of the current monarch. Although he's using Ramses II as his kind of um, vessel for doing this, really this was directed at the current ruler at the time, which was George, the, George III. Okay. You'll also notice that a key message is the power of nature, which you might want to link to the fact that he is a rom romantic poet and he was particularly interested in nature as a theme. So the structure of the poem, if you didn't notice, it contains 14 lines of iambic pentameter, which means that it is a sonnet. And typically these, this form of poetry would be used as a love poem. Obviously this is not quite your traditional love poem, but I think Shelley has deliberately chosen this form to highlight Ozymandias' self-love, the fact that he loves himself and is extremely self-centred and arrogant. It's kind of almost um, used ironically, the sonnet form, because normally a sonnet is used to admire somebody else, whereas here Ozymandias is admiring himself. You will also notice that the poem is structured in such a way that Ozymandias is not being able, not being given the opportunity to tell his own story. He has lost his autonomy. He can no longer control the narrative. This is shown through the fact that he his story is told at twice removed. You've got the main speaker in blue at the top who's telling the whole story, a meta traveler from an antique land. Then you've got the traveler and what he said to the main speaker, two vast and trunkless leads of stone. And only sandwiched within that second speaker's um, narrative is Ozymandias' speech. So you can see how he's lost power because he can no longer tell his own story and it's having to be told um, at a remove by two other speakers. So that kind of... Uh, three speaker structure is used to reinforce the idea that he's lost power over time. Some key themes for you, obviously a very important theme here is that of power, um, particularly human power, which is shown to be transient, meaning not very long lasting, um, as the statue is eroded over time and Ozymandias no longer has any authority. So you can see that power as a construct is something that does not last long, especially when it's human power. Then there's a the theme of nature, and this kind of also feeds into the idea of power because nature is shown to be extremely powerful. It's shown to be completely boundless. 
limitless, eternal. It just goes on forever. So there's a direct contrast between the presentation of human power here and natural power. Human power, which is limited, natural power, which is boundless. So you could compare the two when you're talking about either of these themes, power or nature. And then finally, you've got the theme of time. So time is marching on throughout this whole poem. And it's completely inescapable, just like in other poems where iambic pentameter has been used. It's being used again here to create a relentless rhythm. De dum, de dum, de dum, de dum. Look at this. I met a traveller from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone. OK, you've got that inescapable heartbeat rhythm, which suggests that time will continue to march on regardless of whether you want it to and regardless of whether we have died. So we are kind of irrelevant in the grand scheme of time. OK, and you can look at how the over time the statue has been broken apart and disintegrated by time. A couple of suggestions for how you might compare this to other poems. Um, the first one, I think, is quite an obvious comparison. It's with Hawk Roosting by Ted Hughes, which, as you know, is told from the perspective of a bird of prey who's looking down on the earth and talking about how it all belongs to him and how he's in control. Um, both of these poems are about dictators um, who mistreat their subjects in some way. You've got the idea of cold command in Ozymandias. He clearly was not very pleasant towards his subjects. And then you've got the idea of the hawk who kills where he pleases. He just indiscriminately kills people. And notice how he says where instead of who. He doesn't even acknowledge individual, individual people or animals. So there's that, the meanness and the mistreatment from both of them. There's also the idea that they're both arrogant. They're very full of themselves. Ozymandias thinks he is eternal. He thinks he is immortal. He is the king of kings. Whereas, and the hawk um, thinks that he can control the world. He thinks that the world exists for his pleasure, for his convenience. And there's several different quotations you could use for that one. There is one key difference though between these two, and that is how the power of nature is presented because in Ozymandias, his power is limited and actually the power of nature is far stronger than his power. And in comparison, the hawk in Hawk Roosting, his power is all encompassing. We see no limits to his power whatsoever. So whilst Ozzy's power is limited and clearly it does not go on forever, the hawk's power seems to be limitless. The second comparison, which I'm suggesting you could draw, which is a slightly less obvious one, is London by William Blake. And the reason I'm suggesting this one is because both of them talk about how leaders can become very corrupt and selfish, how they only protect themselves. Um, you'll notice in, in London how it talks about the blood down palace walls, how um, they protect themselves with the walls, but they fail to protect their own people. And similar to Ozymandias and how he's mistreated his people. Um, both show how power can be misused. In London, you've got the idea of the marriage hearse and people being blighted and plagued. And in Ozymandias, you've got him you, um, exerting cold command on people and looking on people with disdain. But then again, there is a contrast. In London, humans have managed to successfully claim ownership over nature. Remember, the Thames has become chartered, meaning highly regulated and subject to a number of rules. Whereas in Ozymandias, nature is made to seem um, all powerful. Nature is made to seem far more powerful than man. So there's a, a direct contrast there. So those are just two poems that you could compare Ozymandias to. Obviously, there are more. Um, but those are just some ideas for you, Year 11, on how you might go about a comparison question with this poem. I hope that's been helpful. Do pop into E13 if you have any questions about this poem and I'll be happy to help you. Good luck with your revision.